Welcome back to Face the Nation. We return now to our panel, and there is so much to digest, yet so little known, Paula, <laughs> about what is actually in this report. Um, you know, a lot has been made, as you heard from some of the president's defenders, about the idea that there were no further indictments recommended. Does that mean the question of criminality has been closed on here? It's great news for anyone in the Trump Tower meeting, specifically Jared Kushner, Donald Trump Jr., because while that clearly looked like part of a, a counter or an intelligence operation on the part of the Russians, it was unclear whether or not anyone in there had committed a crime by showing up. Certainly Paul Manafort should have known better, but it was an open question about Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner. So great news for them that no more indictments. But as we know, the current Justice Department does not believe that a sitting president can be indicted. So now the question is, what, if anything, will this say about the president? Because if Mueller found any evidence of criminal wrongdoing on the part of the president, assumed he would pass that off to the attorney general, and then it's up to him. What do you do with that information? Do you pass it off to Congress for possible impeachment proceedings? You know as well as anyone, Barr is a pretty broad definition of executive power. Um, so he may be more willing to defer to the president on these questions of possible obstruction of justice. So that's the question we don't have an answer to right now and why I don't think you're seeing you know, champagne corks popping at the White House, even though the president, of course, doesn't drink. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and, but he does tweet. And he does. And we have seen nothing on the Twitter feed yet, Jonathan, about this, which uh, up till now, now, the president has said this is all a hoax, like there's nothing really to trust in this probe. But if there are no further indictments recommended, does he, I mean, how does he handle this relationship with his essentially, you know, the lawyer for the country, right. the attorney general, who works for him and the American people? Well, Bill Barr is going to do exactly what he thinks the law commands. I've known him for years, and he is someone who is not, you're not able to push in any direction. I mean, he's built like a linebacker. He litigates like a linebacker. Uh, he will do exactly what he thinks the law requires. Now, the fact that there's no indictments coming out really does suggest that there was no collusion-related crime, uh, because even though you can't indict the president, you can certainly indict other people, and you can't collude alone. Mm -hmm. So he can do a lot of things alone. He can tweet alone, but he can't collude alone. So that may, in fact, be a vindication, but they only take you so far. Right? I mean, this report, if it gets out, could have a lot of damaging information. You don't want to end up like, you know, Big Julie on Guys and Dolls saying 33 arrests and no convictions. <laughs> That's not exactly a powerful argument for a president to make. And you heard from Congressman Schiff, I mean, putting the politics aside, he, he's sort of drawing this line saying, you could have still seen conspiracy, but it didn't rise to the level of being able to indict. Well, I think that... Uh, it, it, so will I, the president ever be able to clear himself, essentially? Well, I think, look, let's not fool ourselves. Most people are going to read the lead on this story. If it comes out that no collusion was found, for most people in this country, that vindicates the president of the United States. I mean, this is, a, this is as close as D.C. gets to an organized sport, but for the rest of the country, <laughs> they will look at that lead. And he has said there's no collusion, and if Mueller agrees with him, it will vindicate him in the eyes of a lot of citizens. And how do Democrats digest this, Ed? I can't wait to see because, I, you know, it runs the gamut from those who have been under the impression that he will get off scot-free to some sense of there will be other things we need to investigate and justifiably so. What I found interesting this past week, there was a poll from CNN that found 68 percent of Democrats support impeachment. That's a high number, nearly 7 in 10, but it's down 12 points from December when it was 80 percent of Democrats believe that way. Why has that happened? Was it because Nancy Pelosi has convinced them that he's not worth it? Is it because they, too, now are reading between the lines and reading all our coverage and realizing that maybe there isn't that much there and we should focus on other things? Or is it the realization that what worked for them in November, focusing on health care, focusing on the economy, education, and other issues, and not Donald Trump, got them into office, got them back to House majority, and might eventually help them win the White House? We'll see. So you heard from Speaker Pelosi this decision she made that she says she will boycott this gang of eight, the, the key members of Congress who are supposed to be or expect to be briefed by the attorney general on the findings. Uh, and that would include more information that's been made public. What is the point yeah. of boycotting the briefing? I mean, Democrats have made very clear that transparency is going to be their entire strategy here. We know, we don't know what the report says, but we know principal findings alone is not going to be enough. I do think it is interesting that the call for transparency is coming from across the political spectrum, although though their motivations are very, very different. I think Democrats still say there's two different standards here. There's reasonable doubt in a courtroom, and there's a political standard by which Congress might want to continue to pursue. 
Republicans, I think, to Jonathan's point, that they see this as a potential to clear the president, at least in political terms, in the eyes of the public. So as much as they can get out and those competing pr prospects. For Nancy Pelosi, I don't think she wants to be in a position where she it's known that she's gone into a meeting with Bill Barr and knows what has been in that and can't talk about it. So in some ways, I can see it's, it's self-preservation on yeah. her part to say, anything you're going to tell me, I want all of these members to know, too. And I do think more broadly, like pol politics, yes. But this report, and at the core of it, is something that the public really does have a right to know. And as much transparency as possible, as a lot of lawmakers I talk to say, they want the public to know it so they can feel confident in their elections. To that point, uh, Hakeem Jeffries made the point, too. 420 to nothing, mm -hmm. the House approved yeah. a measure calling on the Justice Department to release the full report. Nobody went home this past week, had a town hall, and got yelled at for voting yes on that. The public wants to see it. It could be cathartic for, pe for people, frankly, because of that. The other thing to keep in mind, talk to Chris Coons of Delaware yesterday. He makes a, a solid point that the Justice Department has done what it has done legally. Congress has the right and the expectation to do what it's going to do politically and constitutionally to oversee this government, mm -hmm. whether people like that or not. The question will be in the tone and the focus of those investigations. Do they go after the raw material because they're convinced that there's something in there that merits more investigation? Or do they just step back and say, look, there's all these other issues, the Trump Hotel. He keeps drawing money from that. He could be violating the emoluments clause. All the things that are going on at the EPA, decisions made by the Pentagon and the State Department regarding foreign affairs. If they focus in on that kind of transparency and accountability, they may emerge from that okay because the American public will realize they're just looking at the rest of the government and doing their job. Well, certainly no one wants to vote against transparency, but let me try to argue yes. the other side, which is traditionally in this country, you can be investigated by law enforcement, and if you are not charged, they don't want that evidence out there hanging over you. And I know many people have argued, what about the public interest? Is there any investigation where there was ever such significant public interest? Well, yes, let's look at the investigation into Secretary Clinton's use of a private server. Comey there, he decided to err on the side of transparency. And how did that work out? Every word he uttered at that press conference was parsed and it was weaponized for political purposes, not just against her, but also against the FBI and the Justice Department. It was used to undermine the legitimacy of the entire organization. Every single word he used, every adjective, who advised him on that, well, clearly they weren't being serious. I think we really have to contemplate the merit of releasing evidence against people who have not been criminally charged. Is that yeah, Rosenstein's reason then for holding back? I think that is part, that's his philosophy. I don't know if it's justification. Remember, he's the one who wrote a memo supporting Comey's firing. Now, there's a lot going on there, but this is someone who's been pretty consistent in terms of not releasing these so-called declination decisions, not releasing the, the reason behind not charging someone. Because in doing that, you air evidence against someone who has not been charged. And privately, Republicans do repeat what you just said, which is this is a dangerous precedent to set to set, though publicly they challenge and champion transparency. Um, but legally here, what are the next steps? And on this question of obstruction, you heard uh, Congressman Jordan say, no, 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 this was all about con collusion. <laughs> Anything else in here is outside the special counsel's mandate. No, obviously it was not outside the mandate. In fact, the mandate had, was expanded. Exactly. Uh, now, the problem for, for Donald Trump is if he is cleared of collusion and maybe even obstruction by the special counsel, who won't clear him necessarily as, as much as saying, I can't find a really actionable criminal case to bring, um, that's basically breaking out of the orbit of Jupiter, and you still have to go through the asteroid belt. I mean, there is now a <laughs> hundred different investigations that are going to hit you. They're smaller, but there's more of them, and you have to be more nimble. And that means he's got to have greater self-restraint. But it doesn't help. When you saw it with, with Congressman Jeffries, you get a glimpse of what's coming, right? Jeffries talked about, look, there's four options here. Either he's a Russian mole, a useful idiot, and I forget the other ones, A through D. And there was no E except all the above, right? He could be he didn't commit these crimes. But you, you notice that's not on the list. And that's going to be what we're going to see coming out. The knowingly part. Right. Not that the Russian interference is in question, but that the president knowingly colluded, coordinated, conspired. Yeah, he might not have committed a crime. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is... 
you know, I guess it's sort of the process of grieving from, you know, denial to acceptance, but it is possible that the president did not commit a crime. That but seems most likely. We have no evidence so right. far that I've seen that the president has committed a crime, and you know well, very well. Once you get into obstruction of justice, a lot of that will fall on the attorney general's interpretation of what that means, and but he has a pretty deferential definition in terms of what executive powers entail, specifically when it comes to firing your FBI director. But that's not necessarily absolving anything in the Southern District. Right, and the Southern District should concern the president. Yes. That's a whole nother can of worms. He's being investigated not only his business, his inauguration fund, and these outstanding questions about campaign finance violations. You have Michael Cohen cooperating in that case, and it's easy to impeach Michael Cohen's credibility. But you also have AMI, the publisher of the National Enquirer, and its chairman and CEO, David Pecker. That is a case where the president has been directly implicated as individual one. It should concern the president. And I think that his, his toolbox that he's used quite effectively to attack the special counsel may not work as well in the Southern District. So what does a bombshell look like, if that is the benchmark for impeachment? You know, for if, if you look at the standard that Nancy Pelosi has set, that anything to move towards impeachment would have to be overwhelming and bipartisan. And anything that could get overwhelming and bipartisan support, if you think about how polarized the Congress and the country <laughs> is, would have to be something that directly implicates the president. Right. And that is such a high bar. And I do think, politically speaking, when you look at the Democrats, how much political weight they have put into the Mueller report over the past 22 months. Every question asked about impeachment, about oversight of this administration, let's see what Mueller says. Let's see what Mueller says. What if Mueller says, to your point, that the president didn't commit any crime? then I do think that takes a lot of the air out of the balloon of Democrats. And as they pursue these documents, as they pursue this oversight of this investigation, do they have the own political risk of, yes, looking like they're on a witch? But that raises the Southern District of New York, right? Because they've Absolutely. already said Absolutely. the campaign finance crime by Michael Cohen was committed with one other person. Who was that? He said, I was ordered to do this by Donald Trump. It looks a little odd for Southern District to say, yeah, he committed a crime, but this guy didn't. So what could be dangerous is if there comes out a, a finding that he could be indicted on that issue, mm -hmm. but it would have to wait. For, and the central limitations might extend beyond uh, 2020. And that takes us into a whole other conversation, um, but we have to leave it there. Thank Thank you, all of you, for helping to make sense of this. I know it's complicated and confusing for a lot of people, uh, including all of us at times. Um, so we will await more detail from the actual report, but we will come back with a different story, a look at the future of ISIS. Territorial defeat, does it mean they're no longer a threat? The last remnants of the ISIS caliphate that covered much of Iraq and Syria five years ago were reduced to nothing this week, marking a milestone in the years-long effort to put an end to the terror group. Retired Marine Corps General John Allen was once the special presidential envoy to the global coalition to defeat the group under President Obama. He is now president of the Brookings Institution. Good to have you here. It's good to see you again, Margaret. Do we call this victory? I think it's a waypoint. Uh, in the process of eliminating this threat. Uh, we saw that this organization would eventually become a three-headed monster, if you will. Uh, one of it, one of those heads was the uh, core of the organization in Iraq and Syria. Uh, another is the provincial dimension of it today, which is seen in multiple locations around the world. And the third area is, is located on the internet. So I think that there has been significant progress in, in eliminating one of the principal dimensions of this threat. And I have to tell you, in the last 48 hours, as I have seen the, the final operations uh, unfolding in Syria, my thoughts go back to the thousands and thousands of people who suffered from this incredible, abhorrent uh, terror group, but also the thousands who sacrificed their lives to deliver us to this point. And I understand uh, even a news crew hit an IED coming out of the, the celebration. And so the, the sacrifices of our media in covering it as well was very important, I think, to this whole process. Um, uh, I think that's a, a great point for you to underscore. Um, I want to ask you, the president's language has kind of changed in the past few days. He has declared, you know, victory um, and said he needs to be given credit for it, but also pointed that, okay, there is still going to be a threat online. Um, in fact, he said, well, on occasion, these cowards will resurface. They have lost all prestige and power. They're losers and will always be losers. Um, is, is the Internet the real battlefield? No, there's plenty of uh, fighting still to go on, even in the area that we called the province of core ISIL, where the caliphate was uh, at its strongest. So there the are threats not gone on the ground in Syria. Oh, no, no. There's still thousands of these folks that are unaccounted for. And I, and I think that we'll, what we will see uh, in both Iraq and Syria 
uh, in the months to come will be extensive mop-up operations to try to eliminate those elements that have gone to ground, that, have, that will organize in sleeper cells and so on to continue the attack. They haven't given up one iota of their narrative or their obligations uh, or their objectives. Uh, and we're going to see that the, we have to eliminate that, that uh, threat on the ground. And we'll see continued operations, not just there, but if you do a, uh, a connection of the dots of where the provinces of Daesh have been attacking, Daesh being the Arabic acronym, they're clustered in Libya. Ansar al-Sharia is a, is a Daesh province. Boko Haram is a Daesh province. Uh, Ansar bin al-Makdis in the Sinai is a Daesh province. Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. If you see the cluster of these attacks, this is still quite a virulent and dangerous group, as well as being on the internet. Well, on the ground, though, in that uh, so-called caliphate in Iraq and Syria, uh, General Votel, the top, top U.S. commander in the sure. Middle East, testified recently, and he said, the fighters remain unrepentant, unbroken, radicalized. This is a generational problem, and they're melting away. Mm -hmm. uh, 400 U.S. service people will be left in Syria. Is that an adequate number to take on that threat? Mm -hmm. Well, first, Joe is, uh, G General Votel is exactly correct. He's one of the greatest soldiers we've minted uh, in the United States, number one. Number two, uh, the forces that were there were overseeing the final operations of the SDF, the Kurds and the Arabs that we'd been supporting. The 2,000 that the president has that's said he wants to bring That's on. correct. And those forces, uh, their mission was not over for some period of time. Now, eventually, we'd bring them home, and the president is right to want to bring them home. But they were overseeing the essential next phase of this, which is the stabilization of the population. And the paying for that stabilization was happening through our European partners, through the coalition and our allies who've been with us all through this fight. And the, the critical point about what Joe is saying, what General Votel is saying here, is that if you don't stabilize the population and eliminate the basic human causal factors that makes an organization like Daesh attractive, then we, we face the potential for a reflash. Well, that's something President Trump says he's not interested in doing. Well, that's a problem. Then are we prepared to go back and fight again? I mean, so we've been in, in Iraq now twice mm -hmm. because once we came out too early and the second time we went back because of the, we, we didn't finish the job. And Baghdadi is still at large, well, the leader of ISIS. We'll get him. Your prediction is? I, we'll get him. Not long. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to ask you on another topic. Sure. Um, this week, there were some memos that became public from the Marine Commandant, mm -hmm. Robert Neller, and they were published, and he, he describes the current deployments to the U.S. border, we're talking about here at home, um, as really hurting and posing a, quote, unacceptable risk to Marine Corps combat readiness and solvency. Before Secretary of Defense Mattis resigned, he said these deployments were actually kind of good practice. He said they were very good training. Which is it? Are, should we be concerned our military resources are being used in this way? Well, it's, it's both, actually. Uh, the, the wise commander, um, and I would simply say that federal forces don't normally deploy inside the United States. So that's the first unusual dimension of this. But the wise commander who is, is ordered to deploy those forces is going to try to make the most out of that deployment and try to get decent training return on, on that measure. But uh, you know, General Neller is a great Marine. He's been a great commandant, and he has assessed, and it is his moral responsibility mm -hmm. to provide best military advice to the senior civilian leadership of the United States. He has assessed that both the deployments and the costs associated with those deployments will be paid for in Marine Corps readiness. Marine Corps is the nation's 911 force. It has to be ready to go at a drop of a hat. And if we're stuck on the border, mm -hmm. or if our resources are being drained away to be on the border, or to provide for infrastructure development on the border, we pay that price in the readiness of the 911 force. That is quite a warning. Thank you. We'll be right back. Yesterday, an explosive device detonated near the NBC News team reporting in Syria killing a local employee working with them. It is a tragic reminder of the challenges that reporters face when reporting on conflicts abroad. As the fight against ISIS takes a new turn, CBS News correspondent Charlie Daggett and his team report for us on what it's been like covering the final push against ISIS in Syria. Before creeping up to the cliffside overlooking ISIS, we were given strict instructions. They don't want any any lies facing the other side, otherwise okay. we will be exposed to snipers. Yeah. Yeah. No sooner had producer Omar Abdul Qadr said those words than we came under fire. Yeah, it's coming in. 
those are bullets raining in overhead. We just heard fire coming over that ridge. Do we really want to go? Apparently, no we don't wasn't an option, so on we went. As we peered into the burning ISIS camp below, one prevailing thought was, how on earth did we get here? We've been covering the final fight against ISIS since early January. It should have been no surprise that the militant group's reign of terror over nearly 10 million people was never going to end easily or quickly. But nobody imagined our home would become a military base run by the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces for nearly three months. Pretty austere. One of the biggest challenges for producer Steve Berriman was trying to get any communications out. Nights were bitterly cold. At times, just hovering around freezing, our only source of heat was the fire we kept burning. But over time, we managed to make life a bit more bearable. This is a lot better than it was, because when we first got here, the floors were filthy, so they've all been cleaned, and we brought some beds in here and some pretty horrible mattresses, but they'll do for as long as we're going to be here. We didn't want to burden our SDF hosts, so we brought in our own food. <laughs> all right. Which, thanks to producer Aaron Lyle and Carl Taylor on security, actually wasn't all that bad. Pasta with tuna. Charlie, you ready? With no running water, showers had to be improvised. Who wants it next? It's pretty awesome. As the fight against ISIS moved further south, so did we. We just entered Bagus, the last foothold, if you want to call it that, of ISIS, where they've been fighting for weeks to try to push ISIS fighters, militants back. This is as close as we've ever got to ISIS. Actually, it's as close as I've ever gotten this conflict. <laughs> Doesn't exactly fill me with confidence. This way. A day spent avoiding snipers on the front line with SDF soldiers stretched into night. We had no choice but to sleep outside. Driving further back at that time of night was deemed even riskier than staying put. Morning. Doing what little I can. My face. Cameraman my Abdi Kadani freshened up. That's it. I just sleep, Charlie. Awful. Yeah. Did you sleep at all? No, I kept thinking someone was going to walk up and shoot us. Really? Yeah. I wasn't worried about that. It's just the airstrikes. And the rat-a-tat-a-tat-a-tat-a-tat. -a -tat -a -tat -a -tat. There were a lot of airstrikes last night. Soon, we were on the move again. We did return to that cliff overlooking Bagus just as the fighting was coming to an end. It seemed somehow fitting that a terror group that had unleashed such brutality upon so many innocent people should face a final humiliating defeat here in a scrap heap in a no-name town. And we had seen it all to the bitter end. We're thankful to report that Charlie and his team have made it safely out of Syria and are headed home. And we send our deepest condolences to our colleagues at NBC News as they mourn the loss of one of their own. We'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.